So as you guys know, Curated was essentially formed about seven years ago. And really, we, we sort of use this year to celebrate our fifth year anniversary. It was our fifth year having our dealer's license, our fifth year having a real location. But prior to that, uh, you know, and we've talked about this numerous times, we didn't really have the money to buy cars. We were using, basically, Jordy, my business partner, was raising money from investors, and we were using investors' money, and, and really in, in a well-structured way, but the reality was we weren't a real dealership. So at any given point, we'd buy, you know, one car here, you know, one car there, and, and max, we'd have two or three cars in our inventory um, at any given point. And one of the first, I would say, big purchases and probably the most important car that we had owned for a long time um, was a Ferrari Enzo. Now, it wasn't just any Ferrari Enzo. It was a huge leap for us. Um, I think at this point, uh, we had maybe owned three or four other cars that were about 200000 to 300000 this was a Ferrari Enzo that at that period was about $2 million. So imagine, this was a huge jump, almost 10 times more than a Countach in that period. So I get a call from a very, very good friend. This guy's like my big brother, and he tells me that there is this Enzo for sale. The guy needs to sell it, and it needs to sell in the next 24 to 48 hours. And I said, well, okay, you know, is it a deal? And we start talking, he says, listen, it's the last production Enzo ever made and you know my reaction was oh my god get me the paperwork get me everything and he said sorry I don't have anything on the car we don't have anything on the car you have to trust me it's the last production Enzo and you have like 48 hours 72 hours to close so again, this was in a period where raising money was, was difficult for us, and, and even researching the cars was a little bit more difficult. I mean, now we have resources where we can get on the phone with the factory, or we can get on the phone with a, a numerous uh, amount of historians that will give us the details we need. And I also believe, and, and I know this sounds funny to say, seven, eight years ago, there wasn't actually that much information online about a lot of these cars, whereas today, there's a lot more information online and even social media. So he tells me, basically, we've got to move. So I, we start moving. We, you know, gears are turning. We're going to buy this car. We immediately find one investor. It was actually my business partner in the rental car business. And we said, okay, let's go buy this car. Let's close this car. Let's figure it out. So prior to sending almost $2 million um, to someone we didn't know uh, that was in Europe, we decided that I needed to do some research. How was I going to verify it was the last production Enzo? And we knew that very publicly there was the quote-unquote Pope Enzo, which was the 400th Enzo produced. Um, and basically, the Pope Enzo was not considered the last car because it was not a production car. It was actually considered like almost like a prototype built after the production line. So I start, you know, go I started with Google, and, and I actually found one post, um, and the post online was from Ferrari Chat, and it was a very famous historian by the name of Marcel Massini. Um, hello, Marcel. Marcel is probably the leading Ferrari expert in the world. Um, Marcel actually produces something called the Massini Report, and the Massini Report, um, for a fee, you basically get a, a detailed history of the car. I don't know how he does this. Um, he can do it for almost every uh, important Ferrari. I would say all the Enzo era Ferraris, um, some Testarossa, even though they produced a lot, and then all of the major significant cars. So, you know, things like Enzo's, F40s, F50s, et cetera. So I sent an email to, to Marcel, and, and now we have a great relationship. So we're, we banter back and forth about cars all the time, but he didn't know me then. So I had to pay for the report, and I got the report, and it said, yes, this chassis number was, you know, essentially a one-owner car. Um, it was given to a very significant Ferrari collector in Italy, and this was truly the last production car, deemed 399 of 399, and it actually had some unique features. So it actually had, um, instead of Ferrari uh, and, 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 and a few other details on the rear of the car, it actually had Enzo Ferrari's signature in metal, which was very, very cool. We had realized in that process that it was truly a European car, so it, we couldn't just ship it uh, to the US, and we'll get into that a little bit more as this story progresses. Uh, and we'll, we'll, I would say we'll get into that disaster as this story progresses. So essentially, we had verified that yes, it was the last production car, and okay, let's go buy it. 
So I'm talking to my friend and you know, we're discussing, okay, how do we bring a car? So if you're not familiar, the EPA DOT, um, which started in the 1970s and, and now is a, a very important uh, organization, basically uh, allows certain cars into the US or not. They are the, the requirements of the Environmental Protection Agency and the DOT, Division of Transportation, uh, Department of Transportation. And they basically will, will have safety standards or, or requirements of any car coming to the U.S. if it's not a U.S. spec vehicle. Now, U.S. spec vehicles historically uh, had different bumpers. They had different uh, door beam frames. Uh, they had uh, different lights, different uh, turn signal lights, different gauges. Obviously, we use mile per hour. Um, so there's all these different things. And the biggest thing I would say with the EPA is the exhaust. So you have catalytic converters, you have all these different things that make a US car a US car and a European car a European car. Now, the law is that a car that's X amount of years or older does not need to have these things done. So you could ship a car that's like 1995, you could ship it to the US and it's deemed legal. You don't have to make any changes. So with a lot of collector cars, you, you can just simply just ship a Countach between uh, Italy and the US. Now, uh, there was an incredible law that was passed. Uh, it was partially spearheaded by Mr. Bill Gates. Um, when his 959 was actually seized, it was taken by the US government, and that was called show and display. Now, with show and display, there's a bunch of different little rules. There's a list of cars that are eligible for show and display. But show and display is, I would call it almost a gray area of what's considered significant or important. Um, and we could actually probably maybe publish the exact wording uh, on the screen about show and display. But basically one of the thoughts was show and display would allow us, I would call a, a very legal and understandable loophole to bring this European spec Enzo into the US. So as we're funding the car, um, we start doing some research about what would it cost to convert a Euro spec Enzo to the US. Now, because of this car, I've become, I would say, a self-proclaimed expert on importing a Ferrari Enzo into the US. And at the time, we just basically said, okay, we'll, we'll buy a US exhaust system. At the time, there was, I, I think there was like two or three systems for sale on eBay. So you have your catalyst, you have your headers. Uh, there was another piece in the catalyst system and then your rear muffler. So we could buy that and it was like fifteen to $18,000. So okay, not that bad. Um, and then it was the gauge cluster. We could find a US gauge cluster. It was seat belts. Um, Enzos are actually were quote unquote sort of like a world spec car. So if you look on all Enzos, they do have a side marker lights. So the cars had that already. So we didn't have to modify the bumpers. We didn't have to modify the body. We did have to change the rear tail lights. We're exactly the same as a Ferrari 430. So again, very easy. And we did have to do something with the ECUs. Um, so really, we were looking at I don't know. 30,000, 50,000. So this started to look like a very attractive business decision, buying a Eurospec Enzo, bringing it to the US, not just any Enzo, but the last Enzo ever made. And in this period, probably not today, Enzos were actually much more expensive in the US because production was lower and a lot cheaper in Europe, where uh, I would say that an Enzo was probably 1.5 to 1.7 in Europe, um, where an Enzo in the US was maybe 2.1 to 2.5. So a huge spread it, it, it as well. So there was probably money to be made just on importing a Euro Enzo and bringing it to the US and, and then add in the fact that this was the last production Enzo ever made. Super excited. We start getting all the paperwork together. We pay for the car. We plan on the shipping. And in my head, I'm thinking that I have just struck gold. I've hit the lotto without really doing much work. Um, you know, we're gonna buy this used exhaust, we're gonna do all these things, and this was gonna be a slam dunk in two months, I don't know, maybe max 90 days. Okay, so the Enzo arrives here to the US and it goes to one of the, I would say, the more important import companies that do this process. So I believe there's maybe four or five companies in the US and what they do is they actually import the car and it goes into a bonded warehouse and then they systematically change everything and basically in, in a, a book they're then approving and submitting everything to the EPA and DOT. So they're saying we did this here, sign off on this, okay. 
So we start expediting this process. We're excited. I'm in communication with them. The car arrives. And what was really cool at the time, and now looking back, I mean, it, it's even, it, it's really special, was that the last Enzo ever produced was actually imported at the same time by the same company, and we were involved in this as well, as the Michael Schumacher Enzo, which was a very special Enzo uh, unique color combination, unique wheels made for Michael Schumacher. Um, I believe it even had something like his signature on the door frame or some, something very cool. So imagine we had these great photos of the cars arriving in the US, Michael Schumacher Enzo, last Enzo produced. They're going to the same importer um, and we're just so excited now. Now I'm, I'm, I'm really feeling like my career is about to take off. Everyone is gonna know who curated is. Prior to this, we had sold like two Kundashes and a 355, but everyone is gonna know who Curate it is. So I start publishing photos online and I'm excited and I've published a couple great photos on Ferrari chat and people are so excited. They're like, oh my God, how are you gonna do this? Has anyone ever imported an Enzo before? So one of the, the hopes was we were gonna get the car brought in under show and display. And you actually have to petition for that. So we put together a whole package on why this car is important, why it should be in the US, um, and we were actually shot down. <laughs> um, it was not allowed to come into the US. Um, it had to go for full EPA DOT conversion, which um, at the time I was, I was still very optimistic. Um, I've always been an optimistic person my entire life, but I said, okay, not a big deal. Show and display didn't work. We're, we're gonna go through the formal process and we'll get the car certified. So a few months go by and everything gets started and, and I hear after probably 60 days um, that we have a problem. And the importer calls me and I said, oh my God, like what's, what's wrong? And they said, well, the parts that we ordered, um, we were able to order them from a Ferrari dealer, um, but the problem was that they didn't have some of the parts. And I said, well, not a big deal. I found used US parts. Let's try to save them some money. And they said, no, 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 no. You actually can't use used USA parts. You have to buy new factory North American spec parts from Italy, okay? So I said, okay, no worries. Let's sort of see what they can do. Is it on back order? So they said, they're gonna find out. <clears throat> Fast forward another couple weeks and guess what? Uh, they called me back again and they said, okay, well, the bigger issue is that they can potentially get these parts, but the parts are on indefinite back order. Well, essentially what that means is they don't have the parts. They're not sure when they're gonna remake them. So you're basically waiting for someone in Italy to make the parts. So now we have this Enzo that's almost $2 million sitting in a bonded warehouse. We can't touch it. We can't really photograph it. <coughs> Excuse me, we can't even sell it. We can't do anything with this Enzo and we are waiting for Italy to start making exhaust parts. So I'm just sweating. And I'm watching, you know, the days go by, weeks go by. And finally, um, we, we get some good news that some of the exhaust parts are made. And they have to be shipped, then they have to be cleared, and all these things. And the days are just passing. We go from uh, month three to month four to month five. Now, in this process as well, we were originally hoping to buy some used US parts uh, to install on the car, um, which would have provided us with a huge cost savings. Uh, buying brand new parts from Ferrari, as you I'm sure are aware or not aware, can be very, very expensive. So the original thought process of spending 30 to 40,000 had now swelled up to about $80,000 for new North American parts for the Enzo. So again, was not that concerned about that because we sort of had this maybe potential lottery ticket of the last Enzo ever made. It was getting it imported. We're gonna have it here ready in a couple months. So still very optimistic, even though the price went up to $80,000 to complete the car. So now we're on probably month eight and now I'm starting to sweat. Um, our investors asking us for an update. Um, people are asking us about the car. Um, our friends on Ferrari chat <laughs> were wondering what's going on with this car and time is ticking. Um, <coughs> at this point in my life, remember, I also wasn't really that financially stable. Um, you know, selling one or two cars a quarter or, you know, renting even exotic cars or rental business, uh, it paid me a decent salary. But again, I was bootstrapping my way to success or trying to at least. So I started to get nervous. I started to sweat. 
um, and just sort of had to be patient. Every time I called the importer, they would get really upset with me and they'd say, hey, you've got to be patient. And they re weren't really, I, I would say, understanding of my stress or pressure um, at that, I would say, at that juncture of, let's call it 10 months. Now we hit a year. And my investor is ready to shoot me. And um, I'm telling him, calm down, don't worry. The Enzo market is fine. <laughs> you know, this car, we're, we're, gonna, we're gonna make a profit um, and it's gonna be released very soon. And I'm on the phone with the importer and finally the exhaust arrives. The exhaust is on, it passes EPA. And I'm just so thrilled. Um, the dash cluster's in. Uh, you know, the ECUs are in, all of these things are being finished. The rear tail lights are on, and it looks like we are at the finish line. And I am, I am so excited. I already have two potential buyers. I mean, I've just got this, this incredible momentum for this moment. And about, I would say, a couple weeks go by after that year mark. And um, I find out that we have now what seems like a very insignificant problem a massive problem. Um, and the massive problem is that the US seat belts um, that were installed in the car, um, they had jammed. Which to me seemed like, okay, you take it apart, unjam it, and you're good. Um, but apparently, uh, you can't do that when you're bringing a car into the US under DOT laws. It has to be a new seat belt, it has to be working. Um, so I immediately freak out. Um, I'm calling around everywhere there are no new US spec seatbelts at the factory. There are no US spec seatbelts anywhere in the country. Um, and now I'm just on panic mode. Um, I need this car to be released. I need this car to pass EPA DOT. And I need to figure this out quickly. So I'm calling everyone. I'm posting ads. You could probably still find my ads for US Enzo seatbelts if you looked online. Um, and I'm literally praying that I can get something to work. So I finally actually call the importer and I decide that I'm gonna fly up um, and uh, basically go plead with them to help me help them help curate it <laughs> to get the seat belts released so we could then pass and the car could be released to us. So I fly up and the importer did not want to meet me. They did not want to see me. They didn't even want me to see the car. So imagine this is part of this whole process is this is in a bonded warehouse, it's safe, blah, 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 blah. And I'm just pleading with them. I'm, I'm saying, I don't think you get it. My livelihood now depends on these seatbelts, getting these seatbelts to work. Like, we need to figure this out. Like, I, this, this could break me emotionally, financially, you name it. So finally, after two days of pleading, um, they said that they would take an extra look at the seatbelts and try to figure something out. I'm sending letters, I'm writing, uh, God rest him, Dick Merritt, who is the head of uh, EPA DOT. I'm, I'm right, DOT. I'm writing him saying, hey, can you help me? Can you help me with this? Um, and he was just such an instrumental guy. He passed away, I believe, last year. Um, and this was a guy that's been head of this division for years. He was also a huge car guy, He'd written Ferrari books. <coughs> so I was hoping, hoping that he would see me as a young guy, trying, passionate, anyways. So finally was able to get some letters and get some things approved to be able to fix the seat belts, to be able to get the car released. And the importer did actually get the seat belts unjammed. I wonder if they were really jammed, whoever knows. Um, I wasn't allowed to touch it or I wasn't allowed to check it. I was actually ready to take them apart right there. But it was definitely cool. I got to see the car. I got to go through the bonded warehouse, um, which was very, very cool. And uh, ended up coming home and, and the car passed and released. So the car finally arrived to Miami and it was probably the most exciting thing to see the car come off the truck, to be sort of vindicated um, in front of our investor um, and be vindicated for curated. I mean, this was at this moment, the biggest thing we had ever done, the most important thing we had ever done. And finally, after almost a year and a half, the car was released. Um, the bad news was that the bill um, for the EPA DOT had swelled into about $180,000 um, from the original, I don't know, 30, 50,000 we thought it would be. So $180,000, almost a year and a half, and finally our Enzo gets released. Now immediately I go to work marketing, taking photos. We have some really incredible shots that we had taken at the time. <coughs> I was taking photos myself. We had put it on display at every event imaginable that we could. Um, 
and I was trying to milk it for everything it was worth. Ends up one day, a, uh, a very significant Ferrari historian calls me um, by the name of Joe Saki. He wrote the 288 GTO book. Um, he also wrote the Mira Bible. He says, I have a client for your car. And uh, I was actually, I, I knew the second he called me, I just had this gut feeling that he did have the client. I mean, he was that sure in his voice. Um, and he said, hey, <coughs> this is gonna be the price. This is what we're gonna do together. Um, we're gonna work this deal together. I'm gonna introduce you to the guy. He's gonna fly in, he's gonna do the inspection himself, and then he'll tell you what he thinks. So imagine this massive collector, um, who you know, I know has 20, 30, 40 cars, um, who has also had other supercars, comes, flies into Miami, he inspects the car himself, which is very rare in our industry if you don't know that. People are sending other experts, they're sending other historians. This gentleman's that passionate and that knowledgeable that he inspected the car himself and basically looked at me in my face and said, this car will never see the light again. Um, never see the light of day again um, because he was gonna shove it away and put it away. And at that moment, he decided he was buying the car. I mean, he, you could see the emotion on him. He was that excited about the car. He was that passionate about the car and he bought the car. So obviously we celebrated um, that car and my profit from that car became the down payment on my Diablo SV, the bad Carfax car. Um, and later I rolled that into a GT3 RS and I rolled that into a few other cars, the 355 Challenge, so all these different cars. So that actually, that little profit on that car ended up helped me immensely um, start my career and, and, and sort of watch me grow. Um, but the funny part about it was, uh, there was always this big question of what was the car really worth? Like what is the value of the last Enzo? And a lot of people had said that I had sold the car too short. I said, oh, you didn't get enough money. How can you put a, how, how can you put a price of you know, X on this car? And I said, well, you know, I'm, I'm in the business of selling cars. So about a year later, um, maybe a year and a half later, max two years, we'll have to look in the dates and we'll, we'll put something up on the screen. The Pope Enzo comes up for auction. And, you know, in my eyes, the Pope Enzo was probably just as important, you know, right right there. Um, obviously, I would say a little bit more important in the sense that it was a gift to the Pope. It was for charity. But, you know, this is the last production car. That was the last car. So there's this, you know, balance. Okay, the biggest difference was the Pope Enzo was essentially a brand new car. So it had no miles. Um, this car was a one owner car, but it was well loved and driven. I believe it had 9,000 or 10,000 miles. So anyways, I, I said, okay, wow, this will be an interesting, you know, data point to see what the last Enzo would bring. You know, what is the value? You know, everybody was always saying, oh, I didn't ask enough, but we didn't get enough, get enough money. So um, obviously the market for Ferrari supercars had increased at that time anyways. Um, so I figured, you know, okay, uh, maybe it's gonna bring, if a normal Enzo is gonna bring 2.4, 2.5, 2.3, then maybe the Pope Enzo was gonna bring 3 million. Um, I have to look back at my notes, but I believe the Pope Enzo brought five or six million dollars at auction. Um, so immediately uh, upon the auction, my phone started to explode. Collectors, clients, everybody <laughs> wanted the last Enzo, number 399. Hey, do you still have it? Can you buy it back? Can we get it? Can you help me get it? And um, unfortunately, and I would say fortunately, the, the gentleman that we sold it to is just too passionate about the car. He loves it too much, he'll never sell it. And he's told me that a million times, I'm not selling the car. But um, it's definitely probably one of the most important stories in my career and most important stories for the history of Curated because it was a test of patience, it was a test of knowledge, it was a test of basically being tenacious and not giving up. Um, I could have easily given up at six months, I wanted to. Um, but ending up turning, uh, I would say, you know, lemons into lemonade. Um, we ended up making a profit, it ended up helping me start the rest of my career, um, but definitely was one of those cars that if we kept and didn't sell, not that I'm saying we could do it financially at that time, but it would have been worth a lot more looking back. Thank you guys again. Don't forget to subscribe. Don't forget to like all our content. 
Uh, we have a ton more great vintage supercar content coming. Thank you again.